Hello and welcome to Sotheby's. I'm Claudia Dweck, Chairman of Contemporary Art Sotheby's Europe. This is the first of our autumn series of online events, which we are organizing in partnership with Intelligence Square. Today, we are thrilled to be hosting three brilliant speakers from the worlds of art, fashion and design. They are going to be talking about the phenomenon that is Prada, which reflects the extraordinary woman behind the brand. She bridges art, architecture, and design in her own unique way. And her spirit has been and continues to be extremely inspiring. As I speak, the Prada Tools of Memory sale is now live. And this is your opportunity to own one of the items from her last solo show as a designer. With the proceeds being donated to UNESCO educational projects, which develop education for vulnerable population across the globe. Sadam is extremely grateful to Mucha Prada and the brand for giving us the opportunity to be part of this wonderful initiative. Today's event is going to run for about 45 minutes and we would love you to start asking your questions now and we will very much count on your active participation. Here are some technical insights. Underneath the video screen, you will see a tab that says Click here to join the conversation. Click on Ask a Question and a text box will drop down. Type your name into the username text box and press Enter. Type your questions into the text box and press Enter. And now I'm going to hand over to our chair, fashion, journalist, author and critic, Alexander Fury. Hello and welcome everyone to this special event. Today, we are talking about one of the most important fashion designers of our era, Mucia Prada, whose radical vision has fundamentally shifted the industry since she began creating clothes in 1988. Her work has explored ideas well known in the world of literature, art and design, but when applied to fashion seem paradoxical, even revolutionary. Cheapness, banality, ugliness and bad taste. She once told me she liked to disturb, and her eye and mind have reshaped the way we look at our clothes and ourselves. I'm evidently a fan. I'm delighted to be in conversation today with two of the most brilliant creative forces in the worlds of art, fashion and design. Joining us from Paris is Ferdinando Vaderi, creative director of Vogue Italia and a close collaborator of Mucia Prada. He was most recently responsible for the concept of transforming the autumn winter 2020 Prada collection into this Sotheby's auction. Hi, Ferdy. Hi, Alex. Hi, everyone. Thanks for the invite. And here in London, we're joined by Hans Ulrich Obrist, Artistic Director of the Serpentine Galleries. He's curated over 300 exhibitions and is a globally respected writer, critic and lecturer. Hans, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Hi, Alex. Hi, Ferdy. Hi, everyone. Hi, Hans. As Claudia said, today's event is going to run for around 45 minutes. For the next 30 minutes or so, I will be in conversation with Ferdinando and Hans Ulrich, and then we'll be answering some of your questions, which you're able to start submitting now. We really look forward to engaging with your questions and comments later. Bidding for the Sotheby's sale Prada Tools of Memory is starting now, and will continue until the 15th of October. There are one-of-a-kind items of clothing, photographic prints, show invitations, as well as sculptural pieces that were part of the decor of the men's and women's Prada shows in Milan. Ferdinando, you're the creative director of Prada's advertising campaigns. And as we said, the campaign this season is proposed in the form of this auction. I wanted to start by asking you how and when you came to conceive that idea. Well, um, the, the task was that of creating an advertising campaign for the fall winter collection, which is the one we are discussing here. And uh, this was in the very middle of the first outburst of the pandemic. So the challenges are obviously all the limitation that the, pand the pandemic was putting us towards, um, such as the inability to do photo shoot, for example, and also the, the sort of eth ethical um, sort of guidelines that we were sort of uh, giving ourselves not to create anything that would potentially um, be not correct for the times. And so with that also came a lot of opportunities, such as the idea that finally we could really think of something that um, didn't have to fit any standard, any expectation. And uh, 
also something that had to respond to certain needs that became really prominent, such as the um, instinct to give back. Um, so looking at the show, which is uh, as always the, the sort of the genesis of the advertising campaign, we, we realized that this show had been transformed by the momentum we were living from just a fashion show to the very last moment of probably um, the you know an epochal an epochal change uh, in fashion in the industry itself, and also happened to be the last solo show of Mrs. Prada. Uh, before joining RFC most to the co-creative direction. Um, so the most substantial and interesting thing to do seemed to really freeze this moment in time, um, this actual event that had happened a couple of months before in February, and to turn everything that had been produced for the show into artifacts uh, to be sold in an auction, which would also help to contribute to an important cause. And um, this also helped uh, to communicate the, the instinct that Mrs. Prada had often referred to, to the idea of uh, um, giving clothes the functional purpose of objects, which we'll discuss, I'm sure, later in the conversation. I think it's also very interesting that it's kind of talking about this fashion show as a sort of historic event um, for, for kind of multiple different reasons, obviously, um, because Mrs. Prada conceived it knowing it was the last solo show that she would be doing, but then also because of the pandemic, it's it's got a completely different interpretation now. It's you know it's 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 got a kind of much deeper interpretation because there's the whole idea that perhaps shows like this won't be able to be staged again. This may have been the last show that Prada was able to stage in that kind of fashion. So there's something very interesting I think about as you said artifacts. Um, you know, them being these kind of mementos of, of this kind of exceptional moment that is now part of history. Exactly. In fact, uh, as in every fashion show, there is a lot of documentation happening during the moment, because obviously this is a moment that encapsulates the whole season, and in 10 minutes, the whole sort of vision developed for months um, sort of comes to life. And often those, um, those images, these sort of memories remain remain for internal use for the archives. In this case, everything that had been captured and that had been produced became sort of like uh, the protagonist of uh, of this initiative. And so it's really like a, a moment in time that gets exposed to uh, the audience in all its um, complexity. Um, Hans Ulrich, you know Mutual Prada and have interviewed her many times in the past. I wondered if you could speak a little bit about your friendship with her and what, in your opinion, makes her creativity so unique? Yeah, the friendship really started uh, more than 20 years ago. Uh, I don't really remember when was the very first meeting. There were several meetings. I remember a conversation in Milan about Stendhal, about Rousseau, about literature. Uh, and then I remember the Berlin Biennial. I co-curated the Berlin Biennial in 97-98, and we were together at the opening. Uh, I was showing, basically, um, uh, with my colleagues, the exhibition to mute. There was the slide of Carsten Höller, and I will never forget, Mutra jumped into the slide, and uh, that was uh, the encounter in Berlin. And then many, many meetings with Rem Kohlhaas, and I think Rem um, uh, actually, in a conversation once, defined Mutra in a really wonderful way, where he says it's his incredible determination and openness, uh, going against the obvious, going against the expected, sometimes even against the commercial, and always the aura of uh, the independence, and that's, I think, what I've experienced in, in, in all these conversations. I think also uh, one thing we often discuss, which I think is so relevant and what um, is so important about Mutra's work, is that she makes complexity mainstream. It's this idea that things can be most advanced. And I remember, you know, Nathalie Sarot and Alain Rob Grier, the writers of the Nouveau Roman, were my kind of mentors when I moved to Paris for literature. And they were always explaining to me that this avant garde movement of the Nouveau Roman should be something which is very accessible, but also highly experimental. And I think Mutra really defines that for our time in, in everything she does. It's extremely experimental, yet it has this outreach. And then, of course, there is the friendship she has to artists. And we met again and again with artists like Peter Fishley um, or, or Carsten Höller. And then sometimes also artists from previous generations. I think something which, of course, uh, happens in all her work, in all of Mutra's work, is this idea of Panofsky. Panofsky had this idea, and this is a sort of a, it's not a direct quote, it's an indirect quote from Panofsky, but he always sort of hinted at this idea that we can invent the future with fragments from the past. And I think that's a very important aspect of, of all of Mutra's work. No, ab absolutely. It's also interesting you talking about her collaboration with, with Rem Koolhaas, because 
I um I, I spoke with her around um the the collaboration she did with Raf Simmons and she said it was interesting because it was the first time she'd collaborated on fashion because she collaborates on architecture, she collaborates in, in a sense on art in, in terms of the, the curation of the Fondazione. But this move to become co-creative director alongside Raf is the first time she said that she'd collaborated with somebody on on fashion. So it's very much about that kind of breadth of, of vision and, uh, you know, understanding practitioners that can help you achieve a vision that 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 you desire, but across these different kind of mediums and fields. Um, Ferdinando, it, it's interesting, Hans Ulrich just brought up that idea of, of memory and that idea of history and using fragments from the past. Um, and yeah. this auction is titled Tools of Memory. Um, yes. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the title, the, the significance, for instance, of the, of the use of the word tools and, and what the title is, is conveying about the auction? Yeah, I think that um, the word tool is uh, really an opportunity to highlight Mutual Prada's interest in presenting clothes as tools indeed for life. This is something that she always says. An investigation on the meaning um, and uh, the, usefulness, the usefulness of fashion today, which is really her practice. And so as opposed to like presenting the idea of a lifestyle as the idea of fashion as prepackaged formula, I think What's really driving the, the Prada investigation is the idea of isolating these objects uh, into something that can come to life through the through who wears them and can and can live life. And so it's a very sort of sometimes unexpected um, interpretation of the brand, but it's incredibly important. And so obviously this auction had the, was the opportunity to um, you know to to remind everyone about this. And um, I'd also like to to tap into something that Hans brought up you know, a second ago, this tension that the brand lives on or between the, the um, ability to, to, to speak to, to many uh, and the uh, incredible complexity that it's able to preserve in that. I mean, the, the actual, I think, tension behind this idea of the advertising uh, being turned into an auction is the fact that advertising itself is literally became this an auction catalog. And so all the media space developed devel devel to advertising the the, um, the collection is actually devoted to advertising the objects that are ready to be purchased in the auction. And so in a way, the world the, the world became this global living auction catalog, which speaks highly of the um, the interest in breaking boundaries between something incredibly exclusive like the world of art and auction and something incredibly um, you know immediate. Um, but there is another word that I actually would like to ask you more about this idea of memory, because um, as an expert of the Prada's past as well, obviously, I mean, the title of the auction for me was a dichotomy between the immediacy and, uh, and the functionality that is uh, intrinsic in the word tool and uh, the sort of like the fantasy that is implied in the idea of memory and how the Prada vocabulary, especially now that it's the, the, the end of a cycle, the beginning of a new one, becomes very interesting to be analyzed in a uh, in a perspective of uh, that, that goes between decades. And so as a Prada expert, what 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 do you see in this? I mean, I, I again, to go back to the idea that um, Mrs. Prada was kind of aware that this was or was obviously aware that this was the last solo collection that she would be doing. I thought it was very interesting that there was, a, a, for want of a better word, a kind of retrospective element to it. And you can see in the slides that are that are on the screen at the moment, um, these juxtapositions between past kind of Prada-isms and pieces from this current collection. So this whole idea of kind of certain approaches to decoration, um, certain silhouettes, certain uses of fabrics. Um, they all have kind of a, a link to the kind of lineage of of Prada. Um, but the other thing that I think is very interesting about memory in respect to this auction and also in respect to fashion is there's something about the idea that fashion is proposing a future, but then as it proposes the future, it it's staging an event which is ephemeral. So the event, the future kind of becomes historical as it's being created, there's something very kind of maybe a little bit too complex for me to untangle, but I find there's something very interesting in that tension between kind of visions of the future and visions of the past, and then trying to bring both of them together. Also in, in an event that is 
fundamentally, you know, it's fundamentally of the past. As soon as it's happened, it, it, it's become a, a kind of, it's it's become a, um, a historical moment. You know, people write about it in newspapers. It's documented as as something of the past, even though it's talking about the future. So I think this whole idea of kind of memory and fashion is incredibly interesting because then there's also the whole idea that kind of, you know, fashion is constantly quoting its own past. It's constantly quoting kind of sartorial memories of itself. Um, and it's, it's you know, it, it's about the juxtaposition of those quotations that actually makes things seem new, even though it's, it's actually all from history. Um, so I think there's something very interesting in, in that, talking about memory, talking about these clothes. Um, for me, there's something really fascinating. And also, it, you know, it, it does emphasize kind of how important this collection was, um, both in terms of uh, in terms of the season as a whole. Prada is always the, one of the most important collections, but also obviously it's, it's uh, an incredibly important milestone in the history of the brand. And that's why I, you know, that's what's really interesting about this collection is that it is aware of its kind of, it's aware of its historical significance. Right, thank you. Um, um, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, art and fashion um, because it, I think it's very interesting that Mrs. Prada has always been very precise about the division between the two, although she has passions for both. Um, it's obviously evident in the Fondazione Prada, her extraordinary space in Milan dedicated to contemporary art and culture. Hans Ulrich, what do you think makes the Fondazione so special? Yeah, it's actually very interesting because you, Alex, spoke about memory. I mean, you both actually, Ferdinand, as well, about memory. And we live in an age where we have more and more information, but that does not necessarily mean that we have you know, more memory. So there maybe is actually an amnesia somewhere at the stake in this uh, digital age. And of course, it's not about static or nostalgic memory, but it's about dynamic memory or memory as a toolbox, maybe. And uh, Ferdinand spoke about the, the toolbox. And I think Mujabon said that um, art is uh, basically an instrument of knowledge uh, and fashion is an instrument of knowledge, but they are two different instruments. And I think it's very important uh, to, you know, to acknowledge that. And uh, of course, the Fondazione, um, uh, I think we have images now of the Fondazione. We have the, the, photograph the images also of the, of the buildings of Rem Kohlhaas. Uh, the Fondazione has since 2015 uh, the permanent uh, location. Uh, before that, uh, since 93, there have been projects with art, with cinema, with philosophy. And Rem always said that it's an architecture of relationship, but very much, I mean, we spoke before about this idea of the past and the present. And the way you phrased it, Alex, was almost like it's an oxymoron, I think. It's, a, it's, a, mm -hmm. it's an oxymoron. And I think the architecture of Rem picks that up, picks up sort of the Prada oxymoron of the past or, or future and uh, brings that and creates uh, basically juxtapositions, almost merges old buildings and new buildings. And what is interesting is that when we look at art very often, there is a very limited typology. We can only see art in a limited number of spaces. And here there is a real complexity, back to the idea of complexity, because there is a cinema, there is a stage, there is a podium, there is a Kunsthalle type of space, there is a there is a tower. There is also a house, because I think it's important that we, we don't always want to experience art in monumental buildings. And then of course, there is the collaboration with artists. And I think, uh, we need to remember here uh, a Germano Celan who so sadly passed away uh, in April this year, who was a scientific and artistic superintendent and played such an important role uh, uh, for the Fondazione. And um, uh, of course, uh, uh, Mutual has these relationships with artists uh, over years. No? And I mean, Theaster Gates is a great example. With Theaster Gates, there is a real, yeah, here a catalog of uh, uh, a show Germano curated, he, many group shows, the Small Utopia. I think we're going to talk about that later. Uh, when we talk about multiples. Uh, so maybe back to Theasta Gates. Uh, so Theasta Gates is really a long-term you know, dialogue. The Fondazione did the first show of him in Italy. There is, of course, a connection to archives also with the Black Image Corporation, with Black Collectives. There is, of course, also uh, Theasta's role as the co-chair uh, with Ava Duverne of the Prada Diversity and Inclusion Advisory Council. Um, and, of course, the many performances uh, they did together in London, for example, uh, I remember also in, in Miami. So these really, these friendships with artists, I think is, is really important. Uh, then, of course, we spoke before about uh, artists of different generations 
Betty Saar, the next image is an exhibition of Betty Saar, it's the exhibition Uneasy Dance, uh, uh, curated by Elvira Diagai Ose, uh, really works from 1966 uh, from Betty uh, about passage, crossroads, there's also rituals. I think the idea of rituals was very important in this exhibition, of course, found objects. Yeah, there is a retrospective. So all of a sudden, the laboratory turns into a museum and does actually a retrospective of this artist uh, who is now over 90. And then, of course, the idea also that sometimes it's not curators who curate show. What is also so fascinating in this idea of the Fondazione being a laboratory is that sometimes artists curate shows. For example, Francesco Vezzoli, Guarda la Rai, TV, anni 70, it's about television in the 70s. And it's very interesting thing because I mentioned before the Nouveau Roman as a kind of an experiment of literature which wanted to go mainstream. In a similar way, television in Italy in the 70s was uh, mainstream and yet a, a space for experimentation. There were film directors like Fellini, uh, like also Bertolucci, but also visual artists like uh, Paolini, Giuseppe Fioroni, who would, you know, experiment with this medium of TV. And uh, Francesco, together with the designers, um, M&M, &M, did this exhibition really about this history, and again, showed that this history is relevant for today. There was no nostalgia. It's a, to come back to, you know, to Ferdi's point, a tool, in a way, a tool of knowledge, uh, a toolbox. Um, and then, of course, uh, there is also technology, because, I mean, I think we can't talk about experimentation today without also thinking about what are, you know, experiments. I mean, at a certain time, we call them new experiments in art and technology. Uh, and it's something which happens also uh, a lot, of course, at Fondazione Prada. And particularly striking was this experiment of Alejandro Inaritu, uh, which for me was one of the great experiences with VR. He collaborated with Lubetsky, the cinematographer. Uh, and it's really about an experience uh, of refugees. Uh, it was uh, uh, also a multi-sensory experience of total, of total immersion. It was both virtual and physical. Um, uh, so that would be another uh, another example. But then, of course, there are lots of things which go beyond shows. And what I've always been so fascinated by visiting Milan uh, and visiting the Fondazione is that it's really also a laboratory for younger generations. I remember, for example, in 2016, I saw a show by the very young architect Luigi Alberto Cipini, a project where suddenly the Fondazione became an experimental media research facility. Uh, and you could see there a whole new generation uh, you know, negotiating spaces between architecture, moving image. And I think this idea that we need to go beyond, uh, uh, you know, these, these uh, silos of knowledge is, I think, something which is also very inspiring, that it's about bringing these different fields together, not only art and uh, design and architecture, but also, also science, uh, also philosophy. Absolutely. Um, I think it's also interesting to talk about um, the idea of philanthropy. Um, because Mrs. Prada has talked a lot about the Fondazione Prada as um, kind of a cultural institution that is giving back something back to society. Um, and, and also, um, you know, there, there are kind of charitable examples, for instance, through the pandemic, Prada turned over their manufacturing to the production of PPE and donated two complete intensive care and resuscitation units to Milanese hospitals. Um, the proceeds from this auction will be donated to UNESCO's new campaign, Keeping Girls in the Picture, and their Global Education Coalition's gender flagship, education being something Mrs. Prado is absolutely passionate about. Um, Ferdinando, could you tell us a little bit about the, the, this kind of philanthropic connection with the auction? Yeah, I think, uh, first of all, like the, the, the very idea of the auction is really like a machine to to transform a memory into an energy for the future. And uh, I think it becomes very evident in the, the, the goal that the auction set itself up for, which is supporting um, a future generation. And I was talking to someone today to, to get the facts right, and there are apparently more than 11 million girls that are at risk uh, not to go back to school after the COVID crisis um, in a lot of situations that are obviously Underprivileged, and so the the, the proudest interest in education as a manifesto for for the future of our society, I think, comes comes really uh, becomes evident here. There are actually numerous project project that Prada is working on with UNESCO, um, and this is uh, as you said, dedicated to young girls at risk of not going back to to school. Um, but the whole go going back to um, sort of the 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 auction becoming this um, escamotage to sort of uh, support. Uh, 
the future, I think is also interesting, this dichotomy between the past and the future itself, interesting to speak about what Hans brought up through the, the catalogue of um, Germano Celant, the idea of uh, the other paradox that's very evident here is the paradox of value. Um, I forgot to say, and I think it's very important to say that a fashion show usually produces, shows things that are never uh, reachable by the audience because most of the things produced don't actually make it into the store and through a complex mechanism of fashion. In this case, we actually we have access to things that are unique in the sense that they are not meant to be produced at the large scale. At the same time, some things are actually meant to produce at the large scale. And so the whole conversation about what is value in relation to the to uniqueness and the rarity of, of a piece is something that I guess we can tackle with Ansurik at a more philosophical level as a concept that's really driving the art world as a machine. I thought it was very interesting, the, the point you brought up, Hans Ulrich, about the, the multiples um, and the, the, the exhibition that approached the idea of multiples in art, because, you know, it's, it's an interesting analogy that, that you made when we were discussing it earlier, uh, uh, connecting that to fashion. Yeah, maybe we can go back to the image of, uh, of the catalogue. Um, and it's interesting because, of course, the, um, this idea of the small utopia, the Ars Multiplicata, was an exhibition uh, in, in Venice at the Fondazione Prada. And what made it so special is that one actually saw many different uh, editions, many different copies of these you know, editions. So one could see repetition, but sometimes also repetition and difference. And it's, of course, interesting that throughout the 20th century, this idea of multiplied art played a role. I mean, Moholy-Narch was the first artist who realized an artwork by picking up the telephone, right? That he would just make a phone call and give the instructions and then the factory would produce the artwork. And then Marcel Duchamp was interested in that as well. And then you can see it throughout the movements of the neo-avant-garde of the 60s, you know, of course, uh, strongly with pop art, with fluxus. Yeah, they were all interested in this idea of also democratization of art, of uh, uh, making art more accessible. Here is the catalog, yeah, the small utopia. And I was curious because yesterday when we chatted, you both spoke about this idea also of editions uh, and multiples in terms of fashion, something I know very little about, but I was very curious to know more about that. So it would be great if you could tell us about that. Well, I, I think the thing that's interesting about this auction is obviously that the pieces that are shown are pieces from the fashion show. Um, and that isn't to say that they are pieces that, that will not be created, that will not go into the stores. There are pieces, you know, uh, they are the kind of prototype of the pieces that are then commercially produced. Um, but a couple of years ago, I was speaking with, uh, with the, the now uh, sadly departed Pierre Berger, and he was talking about the Yves Saint Laurent Museum and the pieces of fashion that they have in the Yves Saint Laurent Museum. And he made the very interesting point that the pieces they hold there are the pieces that were shown by Yves Saint Laurent in the fashion show. And the distinction that he made was the fact that they were absolutely the kind of purest um, distillation of the designer's vision. The, the pieces from the catwalk show are exactly how a designer wants their clothing to be um, represented in terms of image. Obviously, then, it, you know, when it goes into store, a lot of things become, you know, have to be kind of commercialized and changed. And and of course, when you're talking about additions, you have it in, you know, a size 38, a size 40, a size 42. Um, so they're scaled differently. The proportions change. They, they change on bodies. Um, so I think there's something very interesting about this kind of um, this kind of relationship between the idea of, of a unique piece and of multiples. And, you, you know, when what is it that makes a piece unique? Because you could argue, actually, that every piece is unique because, you know, they all have kind of their individual idiosyncrasies. Um, but I, I think there's something incredibly interesting about that idea of, of, of kind of uniqueness, multiples. Um, and, and that, that kind of um, sort of internal referencing in a, in a, in a fashion. Um, what I actually wanted to do was to return a little bit to the idea of, of philanthropy that we were talking about, um, because it made me think of the idea of responsibility, which is so brilliantly articulated in the uh, Cambio exhibition at the Serpentine, which um, there's, there was a wonderful quote, which was that design has a fundamental responsibility to look beyond the edges of its borders, 
which I think absolutely relates to um, to Mutual Prada and how she relates to these different kind of different spheres of influence, these different kind of universes. Um, I wondered, Hans Ulrich, if you could talk to us a little bit about the exhibition at the Serpentine, and then maybe if we could discuss these ideas of, of philanthropy, because they seem incredibly relevant to the moment that we're living in. Yes, of course. So for the former Phantasma show actually just opened two days ago, uh, again to the public. It had started a week before the lockdown in March and uh, was then closed and we just reopened it. So it's now open for uh, the next weeks in um, in London. And it, as you say, it's it's um, about change. It's about the idea also of actually former Phantasma looking at one material, looking at wood and really looking at um, uh, the, the, the history, the entire of exhibition basically is built from one tree, a tree which uh, tragically basically died in, uh, in Val de Fieme actually uh, during a, a storm. Uh, and so basically from there, they really analyze uh, through also a lot of loans from historic collections, from Kew Gardens, for example, uh, our relationship to trees and also what, what we can actually, the question really, which they always ask preparing the show is what can we do better to understand the connection between the objects we use and actually the conditions that produce them. And they say, for example, uh, certain objects they present in order for them to be sustainable, we would need to use them for a hundred years. So it cannot be this idea of disposable objects. And that's of course where it connects also to one of their mentors, to Enzo Mari. Uh, and Enzo Mari, the great designer, always said that sustainability has also to do with objects lasting. You know, this idea that's there to stay. It's the idea of an object, it's against the idea of disposable waste of resources, and I think that's what you know leads also again back um, uh, in a way to the discussion before about objects in fashion, and again these objects lasting, no, these objects staying. And the exhibition is also a laboratory, so there is a lot of research material, there is uh, films, uh, so it's an exhibition where one can really uh, see through this guest curation of Pharma Phantasma how one can actually address the ecological moment and, and, and design in a more sustainable way, and they also show how many things have disappeared, you know, uh, certain wood no longer exists because of the homogenization of the wood, of the wood industry. I mean, I think talking about that idea of, of things built to last is very interesting because with, with Prada, I think there's this, you touched on it earlier and I, and I think I always, whenever I talk about Prada, I talk about oxymorons and I talk about paradoxes, which is this whole idea of, um, you, there was a, a an exhibition, uh, sorry, a, a collection that Mrs. Prada did in 1996, which was called Banal Eccentricity. So it's these kind of inherent contradictions, um, you know, cheap expense, kind of um, sex and celibacy together in a single outfit. Um, so I, I think there's lots of, of kind of interesting paradoxes. And one of the, the kind of key paradoxes of Prada is the fact that it, it kind of, um, it butts against it, it. It contradicts the kind of seasonal obsolescence of fashion. It very it creates something that is very much about the moment, but in creating something that's about a moment, it gives it a, a kind of paradoxical longevity. And I think there's something very interesting in that. And and also, obviously, things are beautifully made and they're made to last. So there's a there's a kind of pride in the, in the kind of creation of the objects as well. Um, but. Uh, I think that you know that's very interesting talking about kind of sustainability in terms of um, of creating things that are kind of beautiful and that people will want again and again as opposed to things that are designed to um designed to be kind of ephemeral yeah i think that the the meaning of this auction is a uh, is a clear celebration of uh the timeless value of peace uh i mean you're a collector of fashion yourself but it's obviously um the provocation here is to to take a moment in time and to make it to give it the platform to remain timeless, which I think is is, is very due. One thing which I just wanted to add, which also came to my mind, is actually you know when in the form of Phantasma show, they say also when Rebecca Lewin and and Bettina Korak and our teams you know had conversations with them about mm -hmm. about the exhibition, they always said we should actually listen. You know the idea of listening, learning also from indigenous communities in the Amazon, for example, how we can redefine, you know, a different relationship to um, to trees. And of course, I mean, you mentioned before the notion of philanthropy. I mean, I think there are so many crises right now that this notion of philanthropy 
is so important, which is why it's so great that this auction uh, is happening. Uh, uh, and I think the philanthropy, of course, of uh, Patrizia Bertelli and Mucha Prada for art is so important. I think there is so uh, many other possibilities. I mean, you think, for example, recently Damien Hurst did this project with uh, the Fondazione Prada to actually uh, raise a lot of money. It raised several million for, for the children, uh, uh, save the children in in Italy. Uh, this morning, you know, I had a conversation with Daniel Hum, and he basically told me how he reinvented completely as a as a chef, uh, the idea of a restaurant actually connecting to uh, a social service for society by creating a sustainable and equitable food system and thinking about, you know, and that leads us also to large scale infrastructure. And of course, private initiatives are very important in that, but we should not forget that in this moment of crisis, it's so important that we also have large scale governmental support for for all of this. And, and, and I think for this very reason, I think it's interesting to re revisit uh, the Roosevelt New Deal uh, in the 30s and think about what could be a new New Deal for the 21st century, maybe also beyond nations, because for the moment the conversation is all confined by national boundaries. We should think about a transnational New New Deal. It would be a fantastic project for the European Union. Well, I think, you know, people do need to start to think wider about these things. It's, you know, it, it's especially at the moment, it feels like we've reached it, such a kind of tipping point there's so many you know it's the world is so difficult at the moment and that there needs to be some kind of nurturing some kind of support um this idea of giving back which as you said 30 is is so kind of fundamental um to, to mrs prada's way of thinking this idea of being able to contribute something to society um thank yeah, you both so uh, much. i mean sorry. go on go on i'm sorry no, no, I wanted. I just wanted to to basically reframe the auction as this um, as, as this um, machine that really transformed these memories into an energy for 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 the future to to its output. No, absolutely. Um, thank you both so much for talking with me. We have had some audience questions come through. Um, if anyone would like to submit any more questions, just to remind you how to do that, underneath the video screen, you will see a tab that says click to join the conversation. You click on ask a question and a text box will drop down. Type your name into the username text box and press enter, and then type your question and press enter. Um, we don't have a huge amount of time to answer questions. Um, so if you have any that you want to ask, you should ask them uh, as quickly as possible. Um, but I'm going to ask a couple of questions, if I may. Um, the first one is a, it's quite an obvious question, but I am interested to hear the answers, which is what would you buy in the tools of memory sale if you could choose something? Hmm. Good question. Should, should I answer? I would like, I'd love to hear both of you. Um, I think there's a, there's a, there's two ways to go about it. I, I will be split between buying uh, something that is clearly more familiar to the world of uh, of art, such as a statue or a sculpture or the centerpiece of the auction, and the opposite, something that is uh, kind of like um, a surprise to see in this context, such as potentially Mrs. Prada's favorite um, favorite uh, item. That she designed. I think there's an emotional value to her last solo collection that I would love to honor. And um, there is one dress that when we were discussing before the show, um, she she claimed to be her favorite, and I would I would probably pursue that, purchase that. She, it was worn by Gigi Hadid, um, and um, and I think that the emotional value of a personal memory from the author. Uh, point of view, uh, I think becomes becomes sort of like an invaluable meaning in a exercise like this. Mm -hmm. um, Hans Ulrich, do you, do you have a particular piece that you would choose? Yeah, I wanted actually to say what you said just at the end. Now I have the same I have the same feeling. I think it's really important. Uh, and at the same time, also maybe this idea of the unexpected. You know, to choose a very unexpected object because Francis Picabia, the artist, once said. That our head is round shaped in order for us, you know, to change direction. And um, mm. I think it's interesting, uh, you know, in terms of 
uh, of Mutual Parada that there is always this unexpectedness, you know, and this, uh, I mean, uh, Mutual Bond Storm in an interview we made that she has no reason for continuity except her own mental trip in a way. So this idea of, you know, uh, always investigating fields that are not my typical. So I think, you know, the general answer would be to find something very surprising, not typical. Hmm. I mean, I, I think it was interesting um, what you mentioned, Ferdy, that the, these kind of sculptural objects, that the sculptural pieces from the shows um, made by Rem Koolhaas. And I find those interesting. And people would kind of expect me to choose clothes because, as you said, Ferdy, I, I have a lot of clothes um, and, and I collect them. But there's something very interesting about those objects because they are they they are normally ephemeral objects. They they're not normally objects that you ever see outside of the context of the fashion show. That's what's interesting and that's what's unexpected about them in this context. Normally, you know, they they are produced for this one time event and then they vanish. Um, and it, it's quite interesting that they're being given a kind of longevity and a second life. Um, yeah. And also being addressed as 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 pieces of sculpture, as as you know, as as, as works of art in a way. Um, and I think that that's very interesting because it's it's not the context you normally see those pieces in. I also interested in pointing out that um, there are images that were taken as um, backstage photography, as a, it was a routine in fashion to have someone document. And for this occasion, we asked um, Daniel Arlo, a New York street reporter, nothing to do with fashion, with his day-to-day -day practice, but I wanted to sort of feel the tension of this experiment to, to come be backstage and he captured a moment that for me are like a mediated version of the experience, such as the one I picked for the cover catalog, which is, um, you know, Gigi Hadid uh, fixing the contact lenses into Rihanna's uh, eye, a moment that uh, I feel speaks for the uh, spontaneity that uh, exists behind such a controlled experience as the fashion show itself. So a lot of um, memories also get printed in a large format and I find it very interesting objects to be to be purchased. Mm -hmm. um, Hans Ulrich, I would actually like to ask um, you that uh, this is a question directed at you. Um, and it's interesting because you were talking about kind of the unexpected, but I wondered, has has there ever been an exhibition on fashion at the Serpentine Gallery? Yes, absolutely. We uh, invited Grace Wales Bono, uh, the mm -hmm. extraordinary uh, London-based designer, to actually curate uh, an exhibition. It was uh, co-curated by Claude Agil, and this exhibition uh, involved, you know, many of her references, because Grace is very inspired by the creolization idea of Edouard Glissant, by Glissant's idea also of a different form of global dialogue and non-homogenizing globalization. Um, and uh, in a similar way, basically, uh, as we discussed before, you know, this idea of interdisciplinarity, um, actually, um, uh, Grace West Barner brought in musicians like Chino Amobi, brought in artists like uh, David Hammonds or younger artists like Eric Mack. Eric Mack designed a platform. So uh, we think it's interesting, as very often at the Serpentine, we, we want to also support emerging practitioners. So we um, invited Grace to curate her first museum show. We also worked on Park Nights. Park Night is our uh, program where we always in the pavilion. We build a pavilion every year um, uh, with, a, with, a, with an architect. We invite an architect to, to do a pavilion. And actually last year, uh, we had Kiko Kostadinov do a, a performance, a happening, and a year before Telfar. So yeah, it does happen. Mm -hmm. Um, I would like to, th this is actually the, the last question I'd like to ask, and I want to slightly rephrase um, the, the question that's been posed to us. Um, we were asked, do you think fashion will change a lot after the coronavirus pandemic? But I'd like to kind of widen that out. I wonder if, do we think fashion and art will change a lot after the coronavirus pandemic? I think well, a lot of things will change, but I, Ferdinando should go first. <laughs> I was going to give, a, I was gonna give a, a generic answer, which is ex maybe the same. I do think that a lot of these disciplines are, are responding to, to the world we live in. And by doing that, they also shape the world we will live in. Um, I, li I like a quote that I heard that art answers questions that hadn't, haven't been yet an, uh, asked uh, for. And, uh, Fashion, in a way, sort of relates to to the to the world, 
And obviously, uh, I think, you know, the problems and the provocation that these disciplines will react to will be different because the whole hierarchy of values is shifting. Uh, mm -hmm. To which degree, I'm not sure. I'd, I'd like to hear Hans Hurik answer. I think, I mean, it's a very big question. And uh, I think, so So um, uh, definitely we spoke already about the environment. I think the idea of not a separation from the environment, but the togetherness, uh, we become more important. I think the idea also of um, slowness. I mean, we have been thinking a lot about slower programming. And I know that there are also lots of discussions about that, of course, in the fashion world to get out of these, you know, rhythms An exhibition every two months um, uh, then the next show that we start to think about, you know, more like a garden that projects can grow, that they're organic. And I don't think it's a coincidence that over the last 10 days, uh, two artists with whom I spoke have been telling me that they actually want to do want to do farms. Most recently, uh, Otto Bong Nakanga, uh, who uh, is a performance artist, installation artist, who told me that she wants to start a farm in, in Nigeria and that for her, this idea of a farm is much more important right now than the idea of an exhibition. So I think that these are just two points, but I think there are many more. And I think the idea also of artists um, addressing, uh, you know, questions of social justice, I think will become very important. I mean, in a similar way to what I described before for Daniel Hume, you know, what he does within his field, I think that's going to happen um, in, uh, in many, uh, you know, in many different fields as well. But it's a, it could be a great topic for our next conversation. We should do part two. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, th I just wanted to say thank you to both of you. Thanks to Ferdinand Vaderi, Thanks to Hans Ulrich Obrist. And of course, also to Sotheby's for hosting this conversation. Um, the Prada Tools of Memory Sale is live online now, running until the 15th of October. And we hope you enjoy these extraordinary items. Thank you to everyone for joining us and goodbye. <laughs>